Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 123, The Jordan Leopold Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Petlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we jump into the deep end without thinking, hear the incredible hockey journey of one of Minnesota's most respected hockey people and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off by stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Today we have a special guest who has left an indelible signature on the ice with his remarkable career. Joining us is none other than legendary Jordan Leopold. With an impressive journey in the world of hockey, Jordan not only showcased his incredible skills during his 695 NHL games played, but has also become a well-respected figure in the sport. From his early days growing up in Minnesota, the early years of the USA Hockey National Development Program, his Minnesota Gopher hockey experience, some Hobie Award, I don't know what that's about, international hockey, and over a decade of playing in the National Hockey League. I'm thrilled to dive deep into the hockey journey of Jordan Leopold, not only because he's an amazing hockey player, but more so because he's just a good dude. Mr. Leopold, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Hi, Pitt. Uh, those are some big words you use there. I like that. Well, I, you might not think you're legendary, but I know that for sure, including myself, your mom and dad, Jamie, your wife, and your four kids, you know, we all think you're legendary. So I had to throw it in the, in the uh, intro for you. Normal dude. I'm like you. I mean, we grew up in the Robbinsdale School District. Uh, um, <laughs> it's quite a journey to get out of there alive. And, and we did. We We got out and went and did some bigger and better things, I guess. But, um, you know, I just, uh, you know, looking back, uh, I'm in my mid forties now and, uh, the body's a little sore every morning and it's just part of what, uh, I grew up to live a dream. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, uh, the one thing that we both found out, uh, is that when it's over, it's over, but, uh, this just started. So what I'd like to do, if you don't mind with all the guests I have on here, uh, so let's take a few minutes, rewind the tape, go back to the beginning. Where'd you grow up? You just mentioned it, but we're going to go into a little more detail. What was your childhood like? Your parents, brothers, sisters, friends, your introduction to hockey, other sports. Basically, give the listeners a glimpse, a tiny peek of what it was like growing up. Jordan Leopold. Oh, my gosh. Uh, do you have a couple hours? No, I Yes, we do. We got plenty of time. Um, well, we got plenty of time. Uh, yeah, no, I grew up in Golden Valley, uh, Minnesota for, um, you know, the locals, I know where that is, but it's a city next to Minneapolis on the west side, um, you know, adjacent to Plymouth, New Hope, Crystal, Golden, uh, you got Golden Valley, you got uh, Robbinsdale, um, and I was in an area called Robbinsdale Armstrong, which was a conglomerate of, of all those cities, um, and there was also another rival school in that same school district being uh, Cooper, which you went to uh, many years before me. And uh, just growing up in there, there was always a Cooper, Cooper Armstrong rivalry, and uh, it, w- it was a lot of fun. But you know, where how did I get in the hockey? Um, that's one of those uh, you know questions I don't get asked a lot. Um, I had my mom's brother, so my uncle uh, was a pretty good hockey player. He played uh, in the East Coast Hockey League. He played high school hockey at Roseville. Uh, I was always a rink rat, following him around. I, I grew up an only child. 
So my mom, my dad, uh, my mom was actually a pretty good athlete as far as a softball player and uh, some other sports in high school. Uh, my dad was just kind of a uh, uh, an athlete, uh, didn't really compete at a super high level. He ended up playing soccer at a D3 college in, in uh, Western Wisconsin for a year. And then, um, uh, just got into working and supporting his family, which was me and, and my mom. And, um, but my, my area of, uh, of exposure was, was at the rink. My grandpa worked at Roseville ice arena. Uh, he drove the Zamboni. Uh, he worked at outdoor ice rinks. I was with him a lot. Uh, I got to spend a lot of time with him and with my uncle playing ran around the rink. And fun fact is I actually ran around the rink with the Brote family. So Winnie, um, being Winnie Brote and Winnie Brown now, uh, she ran around the rink with me. We're the same age. <clears throat> we used to the, just watch her brothers played with my uncle and uh, went from there. And then I also had some family relatives that, that lived in Roseville and, and played there as well, too. So I got my exposure with that. I ended up playing a lot of baseball as a kid as well. Um, my dad loved baseball. My dad actually played pretty competitive fast pitch softball. Um, when he, when he after I was born, uh, like I say, my dad was an athlete, my mom was an athlete, so I got some pretty good genes. Neither one of them are really tall, uh, but my grandpa on my mom's side was was pretty rugged. He was a he was an army brat. Um, <laughs> served in served in the Korean War. Won a won a bronze medal. He was on the front lines. Um, pretty pretty intense dude. Um, so I think uh, I got a lot of my competitive competitiveness from him and. Um, a lot of the sport traits, uh, you know, through that family. And, you know, also on my Leopold side, um, you know, we, we had good, good athletes. A lot of my cousins ended up playing, um, either D one hockey or division three hockey. Um, so sports has been a big part of my family. It really has, but growing up as a, as an only child, I, I lacked the, uh, the brother or sister <laughs> to, uh, you know, play with during the day or, or compete with whatever you want to want to call it. So my, uh, my friends were like my brothers and I, I didn't have a lot of kids that lived near me. I lived in an older neighborhood in Golden Valley. So I had to ride my bike a, a couple miles to, to go to the next best friends or meet at a park or whatever it may be. And that's just what we did. You, um, when, at what point you say you play a lot of sports and, you're getting um, a lot of influence from your grandpa and your uncle on the hockey side. Uh, when did you kind of have the the idea that, man, I really like hockey and maybe I want to see how far I can take this? Did it happen pretty early uh, growing up? Or well, it, uh... I, I was always uh, I was always one of the best kids on the team. I mean, uh, just being a mite player back when I was a kid, mites you. I played Golden Valley Mites, which is just um, city recreation. And you had five-year-olds playing with nine-year-olds. And my first year as a five-year-old, I touched a puck. I fell down every time I touched it. You know, I was not that good. And then something clicked. I don't know what it was. I don't really remember that early stage of my life. But then I was the best player on the ice for the next, you know, three years. Um, and from that moment on, I, I think my, my parents, number one, knew I probably had a gift uh, and talented, but you don't know. I mean, you see a lot of kids nowadays that, that are phenoms and never end up panning out. You know, why is that? Uh, we can get into that in a whole another conversation. But um, I, I, I had a drive in me. I, I loved playing hockey. It was my sanctuary. You know, as time, <clears throat> as time progressed, my – oh, excuse me. Yeah. As time as time progressed, my my parents separated. Uh, you know, in my early teens, uh, that was hard on the family. That was hard on me, being an only child. I didn't really have people to bounce that off or other experiences. Um, so that was that was a pretty isolated time for me. But what I had was I had my sports. You know, I had baseball. I had hockey. Uh, I had my buddies. Uh, and when I say I played sports. I went down to the park and we played tennis. We played home run derby. We played golf. We played uh, touch tackle football. We, I mean, we played basketball. We played everything. I mean, it was one of those situations where my dad would go to work and I'd be home alone and it was, okay, how can I keep myself busy? My dad would give me a list and I'd be expected to do that list. And after that, it was 
pretty much free time. And the rule was to be home by the time the streetlights came on. That's, <laughs> that's what it was. And, and all that kind of changed. And you, you may remember this too. It all kind of changed when the Jacob Wetterling thing um, happened. You know, yeah. All of a sudden, parents got really reluctant to let their kids stay out alone. And we started getting the so-called uh, helicoptering. You know, everybody thought their kid was going to get taken, stolen, kidnapped. Um, so it really changed, uh, I would say, society in, in, a, in a different way than what it was prior to that. I mean, we were just kind of, uh, I wouldn't say on our own, but we had to figure things out. You know, we didn't have the cell phones back then. We, we had rules. You had to abide by the rules. If you didn't, it was a punishment, uh, discipline, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, a lot of that has obviously changed with the, with the way cell phones and smartphones are. Right. So you talk about being, you know, the playground was your sanctuary. Uh, your your friends were your brothers, and uh, that you were the best player. Uh, I'm sure you were the best in everything. But you know, in thinking back, because I always say that if you want to be better than average in hockey, you have to do more than just go to your practices and games um, during the season. And then in the off season, you got to dedicate. You know, now it's there's more opportunity, but you know, is who are some of the skills people that were in your life back then? Did you spend a lot of time in the winter on the ponds? I imagine you did. Well, I spent a ton of time on the ponds. Um, I spent a ton of time in the driveway playing driveway hockey. My, and my dad, like I said, he would. And like I said earlier, you know, in, in the mid teens, you know, that 11, 12, 12 year old time, my parents were going through a rough time. And even prior to that, um, my dad, didn't want me to be exposed to that so what we did is he would pick me up after work and we'd go down to the park and he'd for baseball he'd feed me 500 baseballs and i'd just hit um you know hit and then go shag hit and go shag hit and go shag and that was till sundown uh in the summer you know and in the winter um and in the summer as well it was driveway hockey it was go down to the park my dad you know as i got older he dropped me off and i'd stay there and order pizza uh, to the park through the payphone, um, but it. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the driveway. I spent a lot of time on rollerblades. Rollerblades, the, the rollerblade lightnings. I don't know if you remember the lightnings. They're the first like lace up plastic uh, rollerblades. Those are the biggest thing ever to come out. <laughs> and I got I got my yeah. hands on a pair of those. Uh, you know, and, and we're all of a sudden went from playing driveway hockey to going a couple blocks away on a freshly paved uh, Hennepin County library parking lot and playing roller hockey. There'd be 10 of us kids playing in the parking lot and all the, uh, all the uh, government employees would get mad at us that we we're taking up parking spots with our hockey nets and all this and that. But that's, <laughs> that's just what we did. I mean, that, that, that was what for me kept the reality of going through a, a situation at home that wasn't favorable. Um, to making making sports my my out and i loved it and like i say my dad was a huge part of that huge i mean it's just pick me up let's go to the park let's go hit balls so let's uh let's go to the park let's go let's go skate and it got to the point where i loved it so much in the winter that my dad wasn't able to give me a ride that i'd just walk to the park and the park was about a mile away so like the old pictures, whatever it was when we were kids, you know, I just put my stick over my shoulder with my skates and, and went down to the park. And that, that was my second home. It really was Wesley park in, in, uh, in golden Valley for many years was legendary where all the Plymouth kids would come. They had really good ice. Um, and, and we just have, have it out with all of us, all of us kids, most of us Armstrong kids, a lot of, a lot of them were hockey players that would find their way down there. And, uh, you know, there was the non-hockey players, but it was always busy. And that was the best thing ever. I can't believe it. I mean, I, I've had a few lessons with, with, uh, kids and they said that they're in their community, they have already, uh, voted on the decision to not do any flooding this year because the the weather's just not conducive for it 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know what? It's, uh, I live in, I live up North in Andover now and I just saw the truck flooding the rink, uh, yesterday and, you know, oh, you're one of the lucky ones. Yeah. Here we are, you know, 10th, 11th of, of January and, um, they're starting flooding. So, uh, you know, the, how much time is really left for outdoor ice? Probably not a heck of a lot. <clears throat> so it's an investment by the city. Uh, but maybe they're just, uh, considering doing a couple rinks and not all of them. Right. But what, yeah. what a crazy, what a crazy cycle we got going on right now. Yeah. So tell me about, uh, tell our listeners about, you know, some of the stuff that you did in the off season besides playing other sports, because, um, the kind of the transition was happening. I mean, how, how old are you? I'm 56. You got to be early forties. I'm 43. 43. Yeah. So, uh, you know, was there triple a hockey back then? Did you, did you have a skills coach or did you just go to a couple week long clinics in the summer? Skills coach. I laugh. Yeah. I have a skills coach. It was called a, a wiffle ball and a hockey stick. Um, <laughs> but I, there was triple a hockey at the time and, and how it broke down, um, in, in my, my era was we had three good triple a hockey teams and that was it. And they were tryout based. Um, you made it, you played summer hockey. If you didn't, you didn't play summer hockey. Um, so you had team Minnesota, you had the Minnesota Blades, which are still around, and then you had the Junior North Stars. Um, probably number one was the Blades, then Team Minnesota, and then Junior North Stars. Well, I played on the Junior North Stars, so I was one of the guys there. And and we, and I just want people to understand. I didn't grow up with a, a lot of money. I was in very middle class family. Um, like I said, my parents were separated, so I only had my dad's income. My dad would work three jobs, uh, just to make some extra money and, and pay for all my hockey. Um, we did travel quite a bit, uh, with Ottawa one year, uh, summer, summer, we had to decide between baseball and hockey. And I always chose hockey cause I loved it a lot more. Um, but I played baseball in the summer. I just didn't go on the out of town trips. Um, and so junior North stars, what did we play three, four years of that? Um, uh, you know, and then, then we got in the national development program, not, de- not development program, but just national programs where you went up through your district, um, you got invited to St. Cloud for festivals and then through the festival, you went to represent your state and then from representing your state, you'd get selected to be on the national team. And every year I was fortunate enough to, to get selected to be on those national teams from the age of 15 till the national development program. And, um, even uh, some senior hockey too when I was playing the NHL, but and Olympics. I mean, I played in the Olympics as well. Um, so oh. it, it was pretty cool, pretty cool journey. Uh, you know, from that from that real young age and trying to figure out what the landscape is of hockey and the routes. And I and now as a parent, I'm trying to figure out what the landscape of hockey is because it's not what it was when I was a kid. You know, we had those three AAA teams and then programs through USA Hockey to help the feeder system up to the national teams. And now, you know, we got HP programs, we got, um, you know, elite programs, we got all this. And I'm trying to figure out how to pave a similar path for my son if he ends up being halfway decent. Uh, but it, it can be confusing too, as you know. Well, I, uh, I did a, a fun episode and, I, I mean, it's going to kind of be a general theme, but I did uh, an episode with Barry Karn, who I know you know. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, and the, the title of the episode is is How to Build an Elite Hockey Player. So it's you got two skills coaches, an off-ice one. You got him on the ice. And we just went back and forth, giving our opinions on what you should do at the very beginning and then work our way up. Uh, it was a fun episode, so maybe you and I can do that sometime. Well, in in go back to to Barry Karn. Um, I, I give Barry and Jody a, a ton of credit for instilling some great uh, mechanics in in myself. I was always known as a as a good skater. Um, and if I go back to my Mike program at the age of five, I, I couldn't skate for a lick, and a lot of people can't. But then my dad put me in the Karn skating dynamic program, and I did it every summer religiously from the age of six until 
probably 13, 14. And really, I mean, I, I dug it. I got, I got into it. We talked about knee bend. We talked about, you know, skating stride, the whole thing. And I was one of those kids when it, it it's probably boring for 90% of the kids. I was like a sponge. I just ate it up. I didn't really have to correct a lot of that as I was continuing to grow physically and, and also mature as a player. So when let's get, let's, you're the best kid on your team. You get to high school now, um, rivalry with the old Cooper Hawks. When did, um, when did it become, you know, apparent that you're going to be going to play college hockey? Uh, you know, what were some special things that happened that those, in those high school years and, you know, who kind of helped, uh, who influenced you and mentored you, uh, continuing through that, you know, those, uh, later teenage years. I, I think I was really fortunate. I had some good people around me. Number one, I had a guy, Mike Miroslavich is his name. You probably have ran into him before. Oh yeah. Miro. Um, yeah. Miro. Miro was an old Eastern rep. Um, he happened to be my, my peewee coach, um, at Armstrong. And I w- I went through a, uh, what do you call it? An age, uh, an age correction process with Minnesota hockey and in USA hockey, where I ended up playing three years of Pee Wee's. Um, I, I was already one of the best players around my second year of Pee Wee's, uh, but instead of moving up to Bantams, I stayed back a level. Now I had a choice. I could have got grandfathered to go play Bantams uh, the next year or stay back at Pee Wee's. And, you know, I, did some pros and cons and Miro was really influential in that. And he's like, Hey, you got a decision to make. You need to be a big boy here and come up with a list pros and cons and start asking people, ask them what they think, you know, and then ultimately you take all that information and uh, you come to a conclusion that works for you and you make a decision and you go with it and you never look back. So I ended up making a decision to stay back in peewees. And I think it was a great decision for myself. And, most people will say, well, why would you do that? You're already the best. Well, I mean, I played with another great player. His name is Pat O'Leary. Um, he's over at YZ, and we grew up hand in hand. And it was always us as a tandem. Well, for me to to get a chance to do that all on my own at Pee Wee's was a great opportunity. And it gave me the opportunity to lead, be a captain, really control games, uh, understand what works, what doesn't. Um, and was it easier for me? Yeah, but I was able to grasp what works. And I don't think I would have ever got that opportunity if I was surrounding myself with good players all the time. The fact that I was on a high end and then there were players below me it gave me opportunities to try things like try moves and take chances and do things that i wouldn't have been so comfortable doing at next level um so playing three years of peewees was big and then i played one year of bantam um in ninth grade and we were really good then i got in the high school played 10th grade um and at that point i was already competing with usa hockey on national teams um and hockey was getting to a point where it's like all right this may be the future um and and then my junior year uh 17 i i got invited to an in-season tournament up in camrose alberta called the viking cup and usa hockey sends a team um under 17 i believe it was to represent the united states we went there and it, it was uh, I mean, the top, the elite of the elite hockey. And, man, we walked out of there like, holy cow, this is where we're at. Um, and I'm saying we, my dad and I. <laughs> and, and then it, it, because it was in season of Minnesota high school hockey, you know, we played the first half of the season, got a break, went up there during the holidays, much like a world junior tournament, and then came back to high school hockey. Well, at the end of that tournament, USA Hockey made a decision to uh, go forward with funding for the National Development Program. And at that tournament, at the end, all the kids that were on this team got offered to be the first ones at the National Development Program. Well, What, there, what year was this? This was 1997. Okay. January of 97. Okay, so we all got offered to go. 
none of us said yes. We all walked away like, okay, there's no precursor here. We don't know what we're getting into. Like, sounds like a great idea, but seriously, how do we get all these kids out to Ann Arbor? You know, they got to leave home. Like, what is this? <laughs> um, yeah. So none of us committed at that point. Um, my dad and I traveled back to Minnesota with, you know, probably eight, 10 other Minnesota families. And we get back to high school hockey. And it, the pace was so, uh, well, I don't want to, well, do you say it? Slow. It was yeah. slow compared to what I was playing. And we were playing at, I was playing at an elite level. And then I come back to Minnesota hockey and it was just an eye opener. Like, holy cow. So I got in the car after playing this first game. And my dad looks at me and goes, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And I, like, yeah. So, <laughs> so like a week later, uh, after the dust settles a little, I, I end up calling USA hockey back and saying, I'm in. You know, and, and that's where I think the light bulb went off for, okay, I have an opportunity that I can maybe go to college and play hockey and maybe reach the levels that kids dream of. Um, so once again, before we have made that decision, I called Mike Miroslavich. I call all the people that I, I helped me guide decision-making back when I was a peewee and got advice, got opinions, and then came up with my own plan with my dad, and we said, yep, we're going to do it. And I think I was the third kid to commit um, for the development program. And they flew me out there, and we did a press conference. We did uh, you know, stuff that I've never seen in my life. Um, like, what's a press conference? I have no idea. I'm just a kid. Like, <laughs> legit. Like, I don't even think I had a pair of... Uh, of slacks to wear. I had to go buy some. I didn't slacks. own. I didn't own a suit. I didn't. I nothing. You know, like I. This is all new to me. I was just a kid that just loved playing hockey. Um, you know, and then made that decision. And there was, as you know, being a Minnesota guy with high school hockey, there was a ton of backlash at that at that time because I was one of the first ones to break the mold to basically move away uh, full time and not not represent Minnesota high school hockey. You know, Jamie Langenbrunner did it and he was successful going out in the Western hockey league. But uh, with this new USA hockey development program, you, Minnesota thought everybody was going to steal all the best players and bring them out to Ann Arbor and Minnesota hockey was going to fall apart. So everybody was scared, really scared at the time. But truth be told is, you know, if there's really elite players in Minnesota, they need to be challenged. And that's, that's where where that becomes important and we do have the best uh, the best system in in the world if you ask me as far as getting people to play hockey and community hockey and and high school hockey where you wouldn't have those opportunities if you lived out in michigan massachusetts uh you know other places in the country just because there's not not really programs that are that are higher end and or, or even lower end to keep kids playing hockey and, until they're young adults what do you know? So you you were actually at the the first year the national development program ever started. What, yep. what? Why did they start that program in the first place? I mean, were they were they getting embarrassed in in tournaments? Or I mean, I never really heard the story. What? Because and was it based off of what other countries were doing? Because was Canada doing that at the time? No, it had nothing to do with other countries, but it, uh, Jeff Jackson, Bob Mancini, uh, Cronin, Dave, uh, uh, oh, our former president, Walter Bush, Dave, or, or uh, how do you even know this, isn't it? Oregon, or, or, uh, Jimmy higher, Johansson, too. Jimmy Johansson, right? the higher ups at USA Hockey, um, looked at our medal count at, at World Juniors, and it reflected how many players we have in the NHL and all this and that. So, with USA hockey, how are we going to change this mold? Because I think the last medal we won was in the sixties. Um, and they came up with this philosophy that we're going to kind of do a mini Olympic program and then evolve the national development program, keep kids in one spot, all go to school together, you know, do this, bring them together, train, and then they'd represent us at, at the world juniors and um, hopefully bring us some success and, and, hopefully drive more kids to play hockey because of the exposure. 
And and that was the thought process behind it. It it wasn't like let's get a million kids going to NHL. No, nothing like that. It was just it was to improve the higher end capability of of the kids in the country playing hockey. It I mean it wasn't we weren't where we wanted to be. We weren't where we needed to be. Um, and something needed to change. So they came up with that idea and and floated it and got funding for it. Found a home in Ann Arbor. Um, you know, that first year was, um, you know, I, I can't speak to how it is now, but that first year was very, uh, <laughs> very virgin soil, um, trying yeah, to navigate. Lots of, navigate. lots of mistakes, I imagine. Just a lot of learning curves, um, yeah. you know, and I'm sure, you know, as the years went by, it got easier and easier. And, uh, but that first year, I mean, there was a lot of eye opening stuff for a young kid like myself. Like it, it was probably the toughest year I ever had playing hockey. I and mean, here you are, I'm a 17 year old kid. I move away from home. Um, you know, I'm traveling all the time. I got to go to school. We're working out. We're, I mean, dog tired. And, and then you really don't know what the next day is going to hold because there's no precedent of, you know, what works, what doesn't work. We tried, I mean, so many different things and USA hockey had their brass there all the time. See what we're doing. We played games in the OHL. We played games in North American league, USHL. We were traveling over to places like Russia. Uh, and it was, it was insane. And, and there's, there was a great article that came back, came out about a, I think a month ago, um, about it interviewing some of us of, of what, what entailed those, that first year. And, holy cow it was it was something i mean even myself like i i got out there i didn't really have a billet family till about a week before i moved out to ann arbor um and so i move in with this family a week later i get in a car accident while i'm out in ann arbor and we lived out in the sticks, dirt roads and all that. And I was, I ended up being late to something or was running late. So I was speeding on the back roads, some dirt roads, and I cut a corner. And as I cut the corner, another car comes the other way and I car goes sideways. We collide. My oh, fault. No. It ended up being my billet brother. Oh no. That I hit. So <laughs> here we are. Okay. He's, he's same age as me, 17. We're like, well, we're like best buddies now, but brothers. Uh, but here I am. The first two weeks I'm in Ann Arbor, I, I, I end up getting an accident, totaling their car, totaling my car. And I, that's it. I'm getting sent home. I, I mean, there's no way I'm, I'm going to be able to live this one down. Like it, I just, I'm leaving. <laughs> I, I, had it, yeah. I had already predetermined. And, and thank goodness I had the best billet family ever. I had, I, um, the mom was a nurse. The dad was a transplant surgeon at the University of Michigan, and all they cared about was that we were okay. Like, we can replace the cars. Don't worry about that. We'll figure that yeah. out, you know, whatever. So, I mean, from God's good graces and their, um, you know, the way they, their mentality was, you know, it was, it was hard, yes, but um, it ended up being the best case scenario for myself as far as even while I lived there playing um, and after I, I lived there, I keep in touch with those guys all the time. When I was on the road, I used to see them in Detroit all the time. I, I'd make it a point and they, they're really special, um, you know, to me. And I don't think I, I maybe, maybe 10% of the guys had an experience like me with billets like that. Um, the rest of them were just like, wow. <laughs> and that's, I got I got to tell you a quick story. One of my boys, when they were their first year in the USHL, uh, getting ready to go down uh, to where their billet was, and the roommate was already there. And with cell phones now and the ease of sending pictures and stuff, he sends a picture to, to, to one of my boys saying, this is our bathroom downstairs. He says, I've been in gas station bathrooms that are way cleaner than this. <laughs> you know, so that had to have been hard for your parents. You know, it, they, they've never done that before and they're going to, you're sending their kid. I, I don't know if I could have did that. Oh man, that's crazy. But so talk about, I, I want to just quickly, the national development program from there to where it is now, uh, there's two teams, the 18s and the 17s. And I mean, I don't think that there's any, 
other uh, program, national program, uh, um, federation that has what we have here in the United States where the 17s, they can go play the USHL. You know, I don't know if they play some uh, lower level D1 schools, but then the 18s, I mean, they just played the Minnesota Gophers here a couple weekends ago. And holy cow, uh, my, you know, so great program. I mean, they, they get great people there and uh, coaching and, and doing all that stuff. And they're, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, the players that are coming out of that program are dominant and, uh, you know, they're getting drafted very high in there. My question to you is I heard that. Um, like the let's say the Russian Federation, uh, if they develop a player and they get drafted and sign, that there's a kickback that goes to that federation. Does that happen with USA Hockey? Do you know? Have you ever heard that? I have not heard that, and I know for a fact that didn't happen when I was when I was there. I mean, it, it, but of course, I'm not part of the financial uh, stability of any of that stuff, so. I, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me nowadays, but I don't I don't believe so. I mean that's above my head. I'd say you got to check with USA Hockey. But uh, no, I was just curious because I yeah yeah. I mean, I, have you ever heard that though that these developing countries or the the programs that you know Swedish uh, whatever that they'll get a kickback uh, if that player is drafted? I I have no idea, but uh, I know I know I, I heard somewhere. I don't know either. Wow. I mean, I you'd have to talk. I think the agents would would know more than that. I mean, and the, and that's something that I mean, I listen. I just grew up playing hockey. When I was at the development program, we still had the same um, the same setup as they do now, where you have a seventeen team and you have an eight under eighteen team. And I was on the older team, um, but there would be weekends where they knew they were playing. A, an older team in the North American Hockey League, and they'd take two of us ki- us guys from the under eight team and say, "Hey, you're playing with the 17s this weekend." Like, okay, so <laughs> I, I'm diverting from the schedule I thought I had, and now I'm going over here, and I'm in Springfield, Illinois, playing in the in the North American League. Yeah, you know, it was just it was crazy. And then you know, we we take our older team up to play in the o- o- uh, OHL in the Western, or I mean, in the Canadian Hockey League. And they were exhibition games. So uh, the Canadians just were like, okay, here comes all these prima donna uh, USA kids. We're just going to feed it to them. And the first four, I'd say four or five exhibition games in, in the uh, OHL were just slugfests. And, and we, <laughs> we had no idea how to fight. We, I remember we played the Plymouth Whalers. Jesse Bolarice would skate around and intimidate us, and they just drop his gloves and beat beat the crap out of all of us and we didn't know how to i mean we we're at the point where we we're going to get hurt um did well, you guys wearing half shields or full yeah, masks no we were in half shields if you were okay. uh, kind of like world juniors if you're under you know that 16 threshold then you're wearing a full that's when we started bringing in some uh retired nhl guys to teach us how to protect ourselves not exactly fight but just teach us how to protect ourselves so we wouldn't get you know broken jaw every time we got in a scrap or um you know, all that so that became part of <clears throat> part of our training which so i say we had to adapt and survive we were just getting our our asses handed to us um in those canadian leagues and yeah. I, I mean it was it was dangerous uh, to a point but the headline was always oh america's best comes comes to canada come come see them play and we we, <laughs> get, we get good crowds but i think we were naive to it. The Canadians knew that they were just going to come after us and they didn't, they didn't get suspended for anything. They did nothing. It's like the, uh, the league looked the other way as, and this was a, a staple of, you know, we're going to embarrass them. And that's kind of how it was. And then finally, when we started to be able to, to play decent hockey and defend ourselves, then, then we got the respect of that, but it, it took a while. And it was, it was nuts. It, but, Oh man, just thinking back to it, like holy cow, we went through that. God. Well, it's it's usually uh, a much more bumpy road for the the first ones paving the way. Well, it's uh, like being a big brother in a big family, you know, yeah. or, or the oldest sibling. You know, you got to pave the way one way or another, and it's always more painful for that that sibling. 
um, we were we were the big brother to everybody else. I mean, we we saw it first. We made the most mistakes. We got beat up. We, I mean, somebody had to break the ground, and we we ended up doing a lot of groundbreaking. Yeah. But it, looking back, it's something where I, I think it instilled a, a great lesson, life lessons for all of us. Even even the guys that didn't go on to continue to play hockey. I mean, we got guys that are lawyers. We got guys that are doctors. We got all these different facets of of life that um, you know. We got guys that are very successful, and I, I think the work ethic that we had to put in to survive uh, being in that program probably gave us a lot of life skills going forward. Oh, absolutely. So I want to fast forward now. I know that there's one thing that you and I have in common is that if they cut our arm open we would start bleeding maroon and gold so you <laughs> you wanted to be a gopher um you were a gopher uh talk about your your time there i know that your junior year was your kind of a breakout year and easily could have signed uh an nhl contract but you chose to come back that, that last year, and it was a, a great decision. It was a pretty special year for you. So talk a little bit about uh, your gopher experience and end on that last year there. Well, first of all, I, when I got my recruiting letter from Doug Woog, it was, okay, I'm on the map. Thank gosh. You know, like I, I bled maroon and gold as a kid. Uh, North Stars went away. I got to watch you and, uh, you know, a bunch of those other clowns that I know I know now. I, and it it was the place I wanted to be. So, I mean, I got recruited by every college around the country. It just, everybody knew I was going to be a Minnesota guy. So they didn't hit me too hard. Um, I took a visit to St. Cloud. Uh, that was about it. And that was just for in case something happened, <laughs> but that was brewing gold the whole way and ended up getting there. But again, yeah, my, my first year out of the development program, you know, you get to that freshman year again, it's another hard year trying to learn campus, um, learn the routine, learn all that. But I think I had a heads up, uh, compared to a lot of my other teammates because I had that experience out, out of the development program. I mean, that it, it couldn't get much more eye opening than that. Um, so for me, it stepped in. I, I played big minutes uh, even as a freshman. Uh, and, um, you know, and we had a coaching change after my my freshman year with Woog being uh, gone and bringing in Don Lucia. So that that was a whole nother change. I consider myself a coach killer at some point um, throughout my career. <laughs> um, but no, Don <laughs> came in, um, gave me all the opportunity in the world again, played decent my sophomore year, and then junior year, it's like something clicked. Like, okay, the game got easy. Um, but then once again, you know, I played really well, got to that elite level at that, at, at the college level, and had a decision to make. So luckily, I've, I've had the experience of making decisions in my past with PUEs and uh, high school, deciding whether to leave Minnesota or not, and went back to those same same people and kind of asked questions. You know, like, what do you think? Here's the situation. You know, it's it's a business and got a lot of input. And uh, the determining factor for myself was my draft year uh, was my freshman year of college, and you go into these drafts and. I went to the draft. I got interviewed by tons of people face to face. And in one of the interviews I had was with uh, Dallas. And at the time, Craig Button, who is now on TV, uh, he was the assistant general yeah. manager of the Dallas Stars. And he really liked me. Um, so we had a couple uh, sit down sessions. Mike Genzel, actually one of my coaches, sat down with me a couple times with with Craig, had, had lunch, breakfast, whatever it may be. And I thought for surely I was getting drafted by by Dallas and we get through the draft and I didn't get drafted. I ended up getting drafted by Anaheim. And after, after my sophomore year, I ended up getting traded to Calgary uh, while I was still in college. And here I am a college kid going, what the heck, what the hell? I just got traded. Like, Oh, yeah, I was, how would you I was feel? so pissed. How would you feel in so that? I don't know how I feel. Because, you know, we don't have advice. We don't have advisors. <laughs> we, don't, we didn't have skills coaches. We're just on our own, and we're just naive young kids. I was so pissed. I went to the bar that night. I got drunk, and I, you know, and then finally I talked to a couple of <laughs> agents. They're like, no, that's the best thing that could ever happen to you. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, Calgary's terrible. 
Like, yeah, that's why I don't want to go there. Like, no, you'll get opportunity. <laughs> you can't put a price on opportunity. Like, oh, shit. It, it, oh, yeah. oh, shoot. And then it, it all made sense. Like, okay. And then they traded yeah. a player and the same exact draft pick that I got drafted for. So it upped me from a second round pick kind of to a first rounder. And the general manager at the time of the Calgary Flames was no other than Craig Button. Uh, so the guy that really wanted me in Dallas ended up going to Calgary and he ended up getting me through a trade. Um, so after that junior year, after being with the Flames for 10 months, uh, I had a decision to make. You know, Craig's like, hey, you ready? I was on board. He's like, yeah, you're ready. If you want to go, Leo, that's that's fine. And obviously, I read him to do it. So during that interview, he asked, yep. So, well, questions. I didn't even remember. Hold on. He goes, okay, all right, we're I, back. You know, let's just Sorry. end it with this, and then you can go and make your decision and think about it. He said, I asked you specifically, what are three things you want to do with your time in Minnesota? And you said you wanted to get your degree, you wanted to win a national championship, and you wanted to be a captain of the team. Have you done any of them? I said, well, no. He goes, well, then – isn't that the decision right there for you? <laughs> I mean, he didn't say that himself because, I mean, he wanted me to sign, but he's like, hey, you got to make a decision for yourself. And if those are real goals yeah. that you want to attain, you can go do them. I'm like, okay. I I felt I had unfinished business with my, my classmates. Um, you know, I, I just, I don't think I was ready to leave again. I wasn't in a big hurry to go do another another Ann Arbor experience. <laughs> you know, I yeah. Just wanted to have one year where it's like, okay, I, I'm going to give it my all and hopefully everything works out and everything worked out to my wildest dreams. You know, we won a national championship. I was a captain. I got my degree. Uh, I won a Hobie Baker award. I mean, it, it couldn't have got any better, um, you know, being a Minnesota kid. So, you know, then the next year, the same offer was on the table and I ended up signing it. And that's, uh, the rest is kind of history. And then start my NHL career, which that was all over the map, but that's, <laughs> that's what we're going to be covering next. But first you just yeah. kind of briefly went over it. So, uh, kudos to you, my friend for going back and not signing because, um, did they could, is it like today where it doesn't matter if you're, Bedard or Connor McDavid or Schlepp Rock like me, uh, you get the same contract, you know, uh, coming out. Not Schlepp Rock like me. I mean, I wouldn't get that contract. I think I had a bag of pucks and a couple small bags of Cheetos as a signing bonus from for me. But um, for you to not sign and to go back with your pals that senior year to win a national championship was that the first one that they won since the. Yeah. Yep. I mean, so yeah. that was huge. And then O two well, O two was in St. Paul too. So that was Yeah, that was, monkey off the back. That was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you, and you were still playing, so you weren't there. I mean, it was freaking bonkers. I mean, I, I then I run into people all the time now. Uh, well, and, and since that day. They once they figure out who I am and they know who they're talking to and they're hockey people, they'll tell me exactly where they were on that day when we won <laughs> that championship. Like, oh my gosh, I remember, I remember. And it's it's so refreshing and so cool to hear hear that. Um just that the fact that a bunch of you know, eight eighteen to twenty two year old kids made such an impression on on people in our state, you know, just through hockey. Hey, what a what a cool what a really cool feeling. Um but I will say this with the NHL stuff. You know, um when I signed it was prior to the 2004 collective bargaining agreement renegotiation. And at that time, there was no leverage either way for me to sign or not sign. Um, I was going to get the same deal as a senior, no matter what. Well, that all changed after 2004, because if you went, what was it? Three years in college without signing, you could become a free agent. You know, so for me, if that landscape was there, Calgary was going to do whatever they could to sign me because they would have ran the risk of losing me. Um, so that that gave me the flexibility to stay back in college another year. Um, yeah. 
and and not have to make that decision as well. You know, you look at guys nowadays, they're talking about, well, if they don't sign or, or they don't leave, they're not going to get cap dollars and they're not going to, um, you know, run their entry level deal. They're going to have to be signed to a two year deal or a three year deal or all this. I mean, there's a lot of logistics that go into it. Um, but I didn't have as many logistics back when, when I signed in the early two thousands, yeah. much like, much like you probably didn't either. It was just like, okay. Um, you know, when I signed, it was basically you were um, a restricted free agent until you were 28, 29, until you hit free agency. And then and then if you had a career, you could make a couple bucks once you got the free agency. But until yeah. you got the free agency, you were you were making, you know, just status quo. My hand is in the air. I'm waving it like I just don't care because that was me, man. Yeah, I know. I know. And I get uh, caught. I get caught every time uh, on the opposite end of new collective bargaining agreement negotiations. It, it ended up being when I, when I first got in the league, okay, you, you need to prove yourself and get to free agency. Well, right when I got the free agency around that 27, 28, 29 years old, then it reverted to okay, now you just have to get through your entry-level contract and then you make money. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I got screwed. But, I mean, I no complaints here. I, I did just fine. But yes. I, I'm just saying, I just missed that so-called jackpot, um, that jackpot signing that you always dreamt about. I didn't really, I didn't really get that super big contract like I was always dreaming I would. Never happened. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, um... The other thing that I want to say is winning the Hobie Baker. I mean, that that is special. Congratulations. Uh, I'm bowing down to you right now, uh, saying nice work, because that's that had to have been an awesome uh, recognition, feather in the cap, uh, for all the, the, the time and effort. Not only for you, but I, I imagine for your parents and, you know, the, the coaches that you've had and teammates that they're like, yeah, we were all part of that too. And we're proud of that kid because he's a great kid. Oh, a- absolutely. I mean, I don't, I, and, and I've said this even, even when I was fortunate enough to win the award, it, it to me, it wasn't, it wasn't really individual. I mean, I had a bunch of teammates that helped me along the way. There's no way in heck that I would have ever won that award without those guys. Um, you know, so it, it it's kudos to all those people that have, you know, fought for me in, in at the youth levels, uh, you know, all the people that have worked with me, like the Barry Carnes of the world, the Jody Carnes, you know, the, in, all the way up, the Lou Verros, uh, you know, the Jimmy Johansons, uh, you know, the USA Hockey, the the Bruce Johnsons of the world, my high school coach, you know, all these people. It's, it's, a, it's an homage to them that, you know, like you ended up doing something pretty cool. And I, I think that's pretty neat. I really do. It's fantastic. All right. Um, we're transitioning to your professional career. Uh, you bounced around a lot. Uh, I'm just going to pull up your, where's your, uh, Oh, hockey is. DB. Here we go. Hockey. There DB. it is. I mean, you got, uh, you started out with Calgary. Did you, did you played a few games in St. John? Hold on. I'm asking the question. Did you play a few uh, games in St. John prior to playing an NHL game or was those nope. three games from an injury or something? So, and you know this too, I, I came in the camp early 2000s and um, I came in the camp and they gave me a low number. And normally when you get a low number coming in the camp, you pretty much made the team. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, without them telling me all the, all the veterans and everybody are like, oh, this guy this guy better be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and I, I was so naive and so stupid and young. I, and I, one of my first teammates was Chris Jury and Chris Jury. He is just, uh, uh Salt I, of the earth. love that guy. Oh, but he's, he's a perfectionist too, you know, and, and yeah. he'll, he has no problem giving it to you and calling you out and all this and that. So, I mean, there were some things that I did as, as a rookie that, I mean, they're unwritten rules. I did some pretty stupid stuff unwritten wise, um, just because I didn't know any better. And, and I didn't have, I I didn't have what players have today where there's a bunch of gophers that have other gophers that they can lean on and go, Hey, I'm going to my first training camp. Like, what do I got to do? I, I I didn't have anybody ask that question to, 
So I had Me no neither. idea. I went blind into this. And like I say, we were probably, I mean, we probably looked so dumb. And, and at that time, college kids, you know, coming in the NHL, like it's almost taboo. Um, you know, but no, I never, I never, uh, had, had to go to the minors before. Um, I played, I played great during training camp and then I ended up getting a concussion up in Edmonton. Um, one of the last preseason games. And this is when we had 12 preseason games and I played every one of them, but I ended up getting knocked out by Dan. Who knocked you out? You, who, who, who knocked you out? You'd cut out there. Dan, Dan Cleary. Um, he knocked you out. Okay. Yeah. He knocked me out cold as I gained the net and he just went right after me. And, and the reason he went after me is because right before that, I, I did a spinorama move, no no look, backdoor pass to Jerome McGinley on a on a power play, and it was actually a pretty sweet goal. But <laughs> back in those back in those days, I was kind of showboating. Yeah. Uh, so they they had it out for me. I mean, they were yelling at me. I knew something was coming. I'm like, oh god, am I gonna get in a fight here? What what do I got to do? Well, I ended up getting tr- just destroyed. You know, and I don't even remember the hit. I just remember going back to the Edmonton hospital and waking up the next morning and driving back with one of our trainers from uh, from Calgary in, a, in our own rental car back to Calgary because I couldn't fly. <laughs> and I missed right. I missed like, the first two weeks of the season. I get in the lineup. I ended up separating my shoulder another couple weeks after I get in the lineup. I mean, it was just a it was a rough start out of the gate and, and the team wasn't doing very well. Um, Greg Gilbert was our coach, uh, Gibby. Um, uh, I had, I had the beast on the back end. Um, Brad McCrimmon, uh, Andy, Andy Scruglin was on the front. Um, screwy. I mean, uh, these guys were funny, uh, fun, tough, whatever you want to call it. Uh, ended up not playing well. They all ended up getting fired at midpoint of the year. In comes Daryl Sutter, hard nosed guy, hates college kids. Right away, I played maybe one game. You're going to the minors. <laughs> like, mm. well, I didn't play. I didn't play that bad. He's like, I don't care. You should have started there anyway. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks for the <laughs> boat. Of, thanks for the boat of confidence. I, I mean, it was almost like, God, I hope to never see you back. <laughs> yeah. So I got buried down there for a couple of weeks during all-star break. Um, and I think I played three games in St. John. Um, and this is St. John, uh, New Brunswick, middle of nowhere. Closest town is six hours away, which is Portland, Maine. Um and it was it was miserable, but I, I planned on staying there the rest of the year because, I mean, after having a meeting with Daryl, he was pretty much like, nope, you're going to stay down there. Well, it ended up, after the All-Star break, Calgary played a game, and they had three defensemen get pretty injured all in one game. So he had mm. no choice other than call me back up. <laughs> <laughs> reluctantly and he had to play yeah. me and I had to figure and I had to figure it out I had to figure it out quick and I don't know to to Daryl to either the my work ethic or Daryl's like vision he saw something in me and gave me an opportunity so um you know the rest is kind of history now was he easy on me by no means at all I mean I was the whipping boy I was the guy who it didn't matter if I was on the ice or not. It was my fault. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was the guy getting yelled at. And you remember those days. I mean, we had some pretty hard nosed coaches back, you know, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And he was one of them. I mean, he was on me all the time. Um, but you weathered, but, you weathered the storm. I, I weathered the storm and I gained his respect. And after all the time I had with him, it was probably he's probably the best coach for me because man, he made my life miserable, but he also made me a lot better hockey player. And I had yeah. that at the program too. At Greg Cronin, he's another guy. He was he was the head coach of our our eighteen team, and he rode me like you wouldn't believe. But he saw he saw something in me, and he knew he had to get it out. And how do you get it out? Well, you push them, you push guys until they they quit. And I never quit. I just kept going. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah. Okay. It, Calgary yep. Flames. I'm, I'm going to keep this moving along because we we are already at an hour. So oh, there you usually go. I'm already going to cue it off, but we're going to keep on going. 
Uh, I want to try to wrap this up in probably 15, 20 minutes. Are you okay with that? Yep, I can I can go fast. No, we don't have to go fast. Just relax, my friend. <laughs> so we're in Calgary. Now, just for the listeners out there, we're in Calgary for f- uh, four years, three or four years. Yeah, three or four years. Yeah, and then we had a and lockout. Then you go, and, yep. You go to Colorado. You go back to Calgary. You got Florida Panthers in there, Pittsburgh Penguins, Buffalo Sabres, St. Louis Blues, Columbus Blue Jackets, and the Minnesota Wild. Uh, over the span of about a decade, a little over a decade. Um, I want to know, out of all those teams, what was the most challenging thing that you and Jamie and your family had to go through as a hockey player, you know, during your career? I I think living in Canada for us, being American citizens, was probably – probably the hardest for us. I mean, it really was. Um, we had kids during that time. Healthcare is different. Um, and, and, you know, you play in Ottawa, so, you know, you're dealing with provincial, provincial healthcare insurance, and then you got to get denied there and then get your bills taken care of another way. And, you know, getting the kids in and out, um, had an opportunity to become a dual citizen, chose not to, uh, could have had my kids born there, chose not to. I mean, it was just a lot of, a lot of maneuvering and uh, just a lot of excess baggage that you had to deal with uh, playing there. Now, did I like playing in Calgary? Yeah, the fans were great. I mean, it really was. It's just the the living was so much different for for my wife and I that uh, it just made it a lot harder. And then when we got back to the states, me in Colorado and and all the other uh, organizations, it, it was much smoother, even though I did move a lot. Um, yeah. you know, and the in season move was the hardest thing we could do, especially when I got older, like my kids were in school, they were established in St. Louis, you know, um, in, in Minnesota. They, and luckily we had a default. Every time I got traded, the kids just moved back to Minnesota where my in-laws were, my parents were, and, and my wife could have help with the kids. And that was, that was the hardest thing. And I think my oldest girls who are now 19 and 17 resent that a little bit because I, I made them move around so much and they didn't know anybody and it was really uncomfortable for them. They didn't really cherish that. They didn't relish it. Um, they weren't outgoing kids. They're pretty introverted. Um, and that was, it's pretty hard for them. So uh, as a player, it was hard for me to watch them go through that. I remember one day with St. Louis, first day of school, my daughter, I drop her off. I think she was in fifth grade and like, okay, have a great day. I go, great. You know, see you dad. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, I pick her up and like, so how'd you do today, honey? She's like, I did fine. Well, what'd you do? You know, how was lunch? Well, uh, I read a book at lunch and I go, you read a book. You hate books. He absolutely despised books. You read a book. So it just told me right then and there, like, okay, it didn't go very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as a parent, as a parent, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this to my kids. This really stinks. Like, and, and it ended up getting better with time, but it was still, it was still really hard. And I knew, I knew at that stage, the end was near just because of the kids and, and my body was going to hell too. But, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of travels, a lot of travels, a lot of a lot of things I got to see, a lot of places I got to experience. But uh, you know, looking back, it was all all great, all great life. No, it wasn't. Life it was a roller coaster. It was a roller coaster ride, and there was oh, times was. where you were in the depths of negativity, uh, beating yourself up, thinking that how can I move? You know, keep on going. I mean, because we all go through that. Well, we go through it, but I went through a rash of injuries. When I played in Calgary, uh, we went to the Stanley Cup Finals in 04, and my body was, and I was 24, my body was spent. And I I had groins, I had uh, hernias, I had all this stuff, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Back in the day, we had Vioxx. And Vioxx. That percent I had. Yeah, Naperson, all that stuff. Okay, and they were what Cox two inhibitors, whatever it was. But it was like yeah. the phone of youth. You were on this stuff, you didn't feel anything. So, you know, here I am, not able to walk off of it. And then I take a couple of them. And I'm like, oh no, oh I feel great. <laughs> I can play, coach. Yeah, I can play. So 
that summer we went to, we went into a lockout and I didn't make any progress as far as uh, my physical condition and then came back. I played a year that same way uh, in Calgary. I think I had my worst statistical year at all of them. Couldn't skate, couldn't do anything. They're wondering what's wrong with me. I'm like, there's something wrong with me. I don't, yeah, I can't tell you. And then instead of figuring it out, they trade me. They trade me the Colorado. And once I get traded to the Colorado, they go, holy cow, you are Humpty Dumpty. Like, yeah. And I think they almost reneged the trade. <laughs> really? Yeah, you can have him back. He's all damaged. I mean, I had two hernias. I had a torn groin. I had, had all this stuff that they couldn't figure out in Canada. Um, so I ended up getting so-called fixed, and I went through a couple other injuries and some stuff. I I spent three three years in Colorado, and I think I played maybe a hundred games, maybe out of three, probably 300 possible, close to 300. And it's, it was a lot of injuries, you know, but that's just adversity and challenges and somehow, some way, somebody gave me a chance going forward. And I kept, I kept kicking the can as long as I could and kept fooling everybody. (laughs) No, you didn't fool anyone. Um, You, uh, you persevered. I mean, I had the injury bug. I probably missed more games due to injury or being a healthy scratch. Uh, But they can't take away the fact when they go on Wikipedia and see that I played in 393 games. Or they played in 695. Yeah, I'm close to 700. And without injuries and bad coaching, I mean, I'd probably have over 1,000. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So... um, this is a lot of people might have missed this, but your last stop in the NHL before you uh, said this is my encore. Uh, you played for the Minnesota Wild, uh, your hometown team. Uh, it's a pretty special story with one of your kids. How you got there? Can you tell that story, please? Oh well, I uh, starting of the fourteen fifteen season. I I was in my second signed year in in uh in st louis i was on a two-year deal it was the last of my two-year deal and um there was a point ken hitchcock and myself and you know doug armstrong came came to a decision where hey, had hitch wasn't playing me so i had a conversation with both of them said if you aren't playing me then trade me i mean i'm not gonna sit around here and rot if you want me to rot and it ends my career I mean, I hate to say it, it's on you, it's not on me. <laughs> I got I, I was I was mad. Um so this was right around the time when Ferguson, do you remember the Ferguson riots and all that? Oh this, yeah. This was going on. Okay, so I wasn't playing and I was getting uh getting skated, bag skated, rinsed, whatever you want to call it, after after a pregame skate. There were three of us out there and we were out with the assistant coach and all of a sudden Hitch comes out and Hitch never comes out to the bench after during a bag skate so he comes out he goes hey you guys are off the ice we're done there's something going on in ferguson and i'm like yeah right i've seen this happen before so i told the other two guys i'm with i said i don't know about you guys but something's going on one of us is going somewhere yeah (laughs) and they're like yeah right yeah right so i get in the shower and i'm "I'm gonna get out of here as my daughter was out running some marathon or something outside downtown like i'm gonna get out of here and go see her so I get in the shower, and all of a sudden, one of the trainers pokes her head in. Hey, Army wants to see you. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I get showered up. I go back in the coach's room, and there's Doug Armstrong. He goes, hey, uh, you know, what we discussed last week, I took seriously, and I got an opportunity for you, and you're going to go over to Columbus. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, thanks. Well, when am I leaving? Well, you're playing tonight. <laughs> I'm like you gotta be kidding me so I drove right to the airport I was in my jeans I was just in my regular clothes drove right to the airport got on a flight and I played in uh, Columbus that night and then um, I promised one of my kids that I'd get back uh, to Kyle he was a five-year-old mite in St. Louis and I promised him earlier in that day that I'd go to his practice and I'm like oh my god how am I gonna hold up this promise well I ended up playing the game in Columbus, and then I rented a car. I drove back throughout the night, and then I was at his practice at 8 in the morning. Um, Holy cow. Up, 
packed up my things, uh, put them in my vehicle, and then I drove back to Columbus uh, with what I needed. Said bye to the family, and then they moved home to Minneapolis over Thanksgiving. And I spent the rest of the time in in Columbus. I was a band aid. I w- they had some injuries on the back end. They gave me an opportunity to play. I played for a month, and then the guys came back from injury, and I sat on the bench for two months, um, and and did nothing. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna get moved again. You know, when when's that time? And during that time, I was living in a hotel room, or I mean, an apartment by myself. My kids were at home, and my daughter penned that letter that said she wanted her dad home. So please treat him a wild. Blah blah blah. Hold on, hold on. What do you mean your daughter penned a letter? What does that mean? Well, my daughter ended up writing a letter. Just I think it was in school or at home or whatever, and just kind of uh, pouring her heart out. Like I want my dad back. I don't. I don't want him to be in Columbus anymore. He needs to come home with us in Minnesota, you know, and ended up saying, you know, Minnesota Wild, will you please trade for my dad to bring him home so he can be with his family, blah. So it got out in the media. That yeah, got it got it. out okay. in the media. Yep, it got out in the media right before trade deadline um, <laughs> that you year. You got it smart. Well, my wife ended up leaking it to Paul Allen over at K-Fan, who's a friend of ours. Um and he took it and he ran with it. I mean, he ran with it. So the joke we always have is, is we made his radio career. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, that thing got, <laughs> we had we had friends and family on vacation in, uh, in Thailand and they heard about it. I mean, it was, wow. it, it went wildfire. And so the media got a hold of it. It went crazy. And then right before the, the deadline expired, I ended up getting traded back to Minnesota. Um, and... Uh, and the rest, I mean, for that first 24 hour period, well, I mean, the request that we had for media attention was off the charts. I mean, I, we had, they wanted to bring my daughter on the Ellen show. I mean, at the time, hey, no, we're not, do, we're <laughs> wow. not, we're not doing that. We're not, no, uh, uh-uh. so everyone was trying to get the first interview and, uh, with my daughter and myself and, and, and the family and, uh, we took a couple of days, didn't do anything. We just kind of worried about me getting home and playing. Um, and then we did an interview with, um, uh, who was it, Hasselbeck on, on Fox News because she's an athlete's wife, uh, like Elizabeth Hasselbeck. And I'm like, okay, she's a former athlete's wife. She kind of gets it. And did that interview, and then the phones just went dead. <laughs> no way. Yeah, it's kind of funny because, you know, everybody wants the first scoop. So whoever gets that first interview, it's like, okay, we don't want to touch you now. Yeah. You're damaged goods at that point. So it was, it was pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of the claim to fame around here. I got traded at home. I played three months. Um, I got to live out a childhood dream playing and playing pro hockey in front of my family and friends and my community. And, um, the next summer I wanted, I wanted to try to squeeze one more year out and then, I had some, I had some talks with Chuck Fletcher at the time, and uh, it just didn't end up working out. And you know that's, and I went, I'm done. I remember showing up the workout after they signed uh, signed Nate Prosser, who was between Prosser and myself sticking around, and they signed Nate, and I went to workout. So I I said, hey guys, um, this is the end. I'm not going to be at workout tomorrow. This is it. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> and yeah. I don't think I've touched a weight since. <laughs> oh, I just oh man I I worked so hard uh, just to try to keep up with guys that were more elite than I was um throughout my career and battled injuries and just kept going and never stopped that once I hit the kill button it was it was official no way in heck you couldn't have called me a week later and said hey do you want to keep playing I like no nope, yeah. I'm done yeah not a chance I was in the mind frame and once I decided I was done, the amount of stress that was that washed through and out my body was amazing. I mean, I didn't realize how stressful pro sports was until I actually said I'm done. Yeah, that, isn't that, that the truth? Isn't that the truth? I mean, you're living and dying on on a sword's edge all the time, and you're reading about yourself in the paper, and you know, there's people always asking you questions and nothing's private it, it's just you don't realize it until you get out of it and really since i got out of it it's been uh, I mean, absolutely wonderful i mean i'm i'm the kind of guy that can just go up in the woods and disappear and be be happy with that um, yeah. but i do also understand that there's people that want to 
want to see me and this and that. And that's great too. I, I don't mind it. I play that part. Um, I'll never blow anybody off. And just, that's the way I was, I was uh, raised. You know? Yeah. And here I am yeah. chasing my kid around like you are. Hey, you know, you're chasing your kids around. Your kids are now, now pretty much grown up. And I got, I got a son now that's going to go into high school hockey next year. And it seems like it's all starting over again. Yeah. You know, it, it is interesting. Um, because when it, when it is, I, I experienced the same thing when it was over, there was just some, a weight that was just lifted off of you. And I, I think you experience a version of that at the end of the season, especially if you had to go through a tough season that yeah. you get through it once it's over and you get home and you get into your summer routine, you know, there's a weight lifted off of it. Um, but with that being said, um, I, I had a, uh, you know, I think more pro players, I don't know the stats, but I would think that more players than not, um, at the end of their career, uh, it, it probably isn't the, the smoothest and, you know, you're just, you're trying to figure out, can I do it one more year? But when you do make that, even if you're bitter at the end, um, and we all have those, those feelings. Um, once it's over and you get a couple years away from the game, you look back at what you experienced and what you accomplished as a player, and you have to say, okay, pat yourself on the back a little bit. Well, job. Well, well, well done. You know, you did well. Um, did you give yourself that, uh, even though you were so bitter at the end? Well, it wasn't necessarily bitter. I just, my body was given out to a, my knees, my knees were bad. I, and the guys that played with me at the end, I, I had hot packs on my knees for yeah. an hour before I go skate ever. I mean, it was just, I was trying to squeak everything I could out of my body. And I, I mean, I, I did all the way to the end. And like I say, when I, when I said I'm done, I was done. And mentally it took me a few months to get over it. Um, but I think for my kids, I mean, I got to start coaching and doing stuff and become involved and, and, and that part was nice. And, and a lot of yeah. people don't realize for myself, I mean, I, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when I was 15. Um, so wow. I mean, ulcerative colitis affects your colon and colon absorbs all the nutrients. Well, I wasn't absorbing nutrients and all this and that. So I mean, I, I had a deficiency in all that. And to overcome that and be able to lift weights and, and it was, it got worse as stress got higher. So when you're talking about going into the off season, I would have a stressful season and then I get to the off season and hit and turn the switch off for a little bit. I'd always get sick because I, I was holding so much stress and it was like a, a huge stress relief on my body and it just killed me. It just put me like right, right in bed. I wow. had a couple, couple weeks of recovery every year. There was, there was a year I was a free agent and I ended up, um, finishing the year in, in Pittsburgh. And then I was a free agent and I signed a deal. I think the deal I signed in, in, um, Buffalo it was a three-year deal. I think I was in the hospital when I signed it. Uh, wow. just from complications from my ulcerative colitis. Um, I lost like 20, 25 pounds. Nobody knew I was in the hospital. Nobody knew I was struggling, but I mean, very easily that could have, that could have turned negatively on me if media would have found out and, you know, other people knew what was going on. I would have never signed that deal. Now I knew I was going to be fine in the end, but I was still in the hospital and a lot of people would have questions going, okay, is this guy ever going to play again? <laughs> right. <laughs> also, um, yeah, that's why I say as a player, you gotta you, you gotta fend for yourself. You got you everything's calculated, everything's stressful, and, and until you turn that off, you don't realize it. And that's no. that's where that's where you and I are at now. Where you know we haven't played for many many years, and it, you look back and go, "Holy cow, I did that! Like we lived like that, and I trained like that. Like wow, <laughs> I could never do that again." But with that being said, we're getting in front of people, our kids, your son, your, I don't know if any of your daughters play, but, um, and then the teams that we coach and they're on that journey. And, you know, what, what's the message that we're going to send to them? It's 
keep on persevering and go for it because I wouldn't change anything, any of the experiences that I had as a hockey player, the worst ones. I, 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 I wouldn't because that's what shapes us and that's what, you know, bonds us to the game that we play, you know, that we love. Well, that's what builds your character, you know, and, and you look back at it and, and when you're working with kids and you're working with parents um, that have never had the experience that we've had, I, I, I don't, and I can say this personally, you know, I'm coaching high school hockey. I don't think parents and even players, and, and I was in the same, same boat. I don't think they have any idea how hard it really is. <laughs> it is. No. Yeah. It is really hard to be a professional athlete. I don't care what what you have. I mean, I just watched um, what was it, the Beckham documentary on Netflix oh. last week, and I'm oh. like, it brought back memories. I'm like, holy crap! Like, yeah, that guy's one of the best in the world and one of the biggest figures. But I mean, on a smaller scale, that's somewhat of what what we got to experience. Yeah. Um, and if I didn't experience, I got to play with guys that that had that experience, like a Sidney Crosby, like a Jerome McGinley, like a Joe Sackick. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going, holy cow. <laughs> Just under a microscope. Yeah, all the time. Microscope, mi- microscope. So, I mean, and, and, and the thing is, it's not just the hockey. It's away from hockey as well. You just never, you can never leave it or never not be exposed to that. You can never get a day off. You just, like, you could you imagine being Tiger Woods? You can never hide. No. No, I would go, I would invest heavily in an underground bunker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of how I am too. You know, and, and right now I live on 10 acres I'm in the middle of kind of nowhere on a dirt road. And it's, it's a bit refreshing compared to what, what I had, you know, 20 years prior because I was always accessible and people were able to knock on the door and it's not like that anymore, which is great. Yeah. Okay. We're, uh, we're going to wrap this up. I need to know. I don't need to know because I know, but uh, other people, what what wakes you know gets you excited to wake up in the morning? What do you got going on now, and how can people find you? Because my my typical day daily routine during a school year, I wake up and I I get the kids uh, I get the kids off to to school. I make sure I have my couple cups of coffee. Uh, if I don't have those, I'm I'm done. Um, but what, what keeps me busy? Uh, I kind of, a kind of like my career, I'm a journeyman. I just jack of all trades, you know, wasn't, wasn't specifically good at one thing, but could be able, I could participate with anything. It's like, I, I can build stuff. I can, um, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to weld. I just don't know how to weld, but I woodwork, um, fixing stuff mechanically inclined. That's me. So I end up being what my wife calls a putz, I putz around, I fix stuff, I get in the, I get in the way too many projects that I shouldn't and don't finish them, and um, just to kind of keep myself busy. But um, the other thing is hockey. I mean, my life was revolved around hockey. I have kids in it now, so I'm invested in that with them. Um, and and then my wife has her own business, which is an event center, and I partner with her in that, make sure the building's up and running. You know, sometimes with meet clients, I work a lot of events. Um, I don't know. What do you mean an of... event? What do you mean an event center? Like if uh, my Zuckerberg was going to come here and want to have an event, is he calling you or what? Yeah, he can. He can call me. Yeah, we have an eleven. <laughs> we have an eleven thousand square foot building up in uh, up in Brooklyn Park on the six ten River Bridge. So um, our bread and butter is weddings. You know, we have a pitlick wedding, whatever it may be. Um, you know, we're hosting that uh, liquor all license, right. all that. I mean, it's it's a it, we run a business, we run a family business. All my kids work there. Um, my wife and I work there. And, you know, on the side, I I have a childhood friend, one of those kids I used to run around with uh, when I was young. They would meet at the park and play. He uh, he became an arborist, so he hangs in trees. I'm on the ground being being a slave and moving brush. Um, just to keep myself busy and stay in the outdoors. I love it. I, I mean, there's nothing like putting a chainsaw in your hand and just ripping up some wood. Oh, <laughs> I, <laughs> living so life I, on the edge. I'm, I'm like during the winter, I'm just like you. So I got one of those industrial leaf blower things. So I don't shovel snow. I blow it. I got to fire it up and get out there and get my blower. And I, 
this snow that we've had the last couple of days has been awesome because I can use my blower. <laughs> Well, see, I'm I'm the same way, but now I, since I moved on acres, I have a bobcat, and when you have a bobcat, you oh. can almost do anything. It's <laughs> it's not even it's not even fair. I always dreamt of uh, owning one, and now that I own one, like I need four of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can't just have one. You got to have a couple backups too. Okay, oh, now I know why. Truck. Now I know why Jamie says you're a putzer. I mean, if yeah. you, <laughs> you got that that. <laughs> You can be making four wheeler trails, making jumps, moguls. <laughs> yep, yep. That's awesome. And, you know, there's nothing like moving a, a, a pile of dirt from one one end of the yard to the other. It's the greatest feeling ever. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome, uh, yeah. dude. I just want to say thank you not only for being here, but um, just for being you and uh, being part of hockey. But you know, making your imprint as a player. But I always love the fact when um, people go back and they, they give back what they learned. They call it the her- hero's journey, I think. Um, you, you go out on an adventure and you have some hardship and you uh, defeat Lord Vader or whatever demon you're <laughs> And then you, you come back to, to where you grew up and you, you pass on that knowledge to not only your family and kids, but uh, to the other people that you get involved with. So I'm super excited that you are still involved in hockey. I didn't know that uh, you were out in Andover helping out out there. So thank you for that. And um, just thank you for sharing your journey. There's so many golden nuggets for young players that are looking to uh, try to, you know, follow that same path that, that, that you paved, uh, do you have any advice for some young hockey hopeful right now here before I let you go? Well, I, I, I tell kids this every day, like control what you can. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can't control, but the one thing you can control is your effort and your attitude. That's it. You know, and or two things I should say. And, and those are the driving force of what, what builds you as a character, you know, what, how you're going to present yourself, how you're going to act. And it's not always off the ice. It's on the ice too. You know? So if you can control what you can, you have, a, you have a chance to do anything you put your mind to. It's just a matter of how hard you want to work. You know? yeah. And yes, some people are blessed with skill, talent, genes, whatever it may be. They just have a leg up. You know, yeah. If they don't want to work hard, you can catch them. And I've, I've seen it left and right. And you have too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, Hey, I gotta, I gotta ask you a question. Bit. So, um, gosh, what did we, back in the day, we used to do some promos for Robinsdale stuff. Um, but you used to have a alter ego hockey player. Um, do you still use that character? I, me? Yeah. No, it was probably my brother, like Dustin McCracken. Yeah. Is that yeah. who you're thinking about? Yeah. yeah. No, that was my brother. He he was a uh, uh, that's his alter ego. He he uh, maybe could have played Division One, but he liked the summer activities. And one of his activities was uh, tubing. And oh. going into his senior year, he was tubing, blew out his shoulder. Uh, ended up playing junior. Next summer, did the same thing. So he played Division Three out at Stevens Point, but. <laughs> It's a, it's some people have their deal, you know. Some people like to read on a Friday or Saturday night. Uh, <laughs> what he would like to do after a weekend series is he would dress up as a character, uh, for example, like uh, 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 a worker at the um shoe factory. Uh, what's the what Red Wings shoe factory? Yeah, Red Wings shoe, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he would wear like a light blue jumpsuit and you know, moon boots and a wig and stuff, and he'd go out to the bar and he would be a worker there and he would have a voice or uh you know an accent and he would play that part the whole time. So when I got into my stuff and he re- you know finished playing hockey, we just did some fun little uh things on for social media and it was called the goal scoring celebration series where a lot of people score goals and they just don't know what to do once that (laughs) happens as far as celebrating so we give them a bunch of things but yeah that's my brother uh adam he he was awesome okay i didn't know if that was you or what the deal was i I just cracked up when i saw that (laughs) stuff oh gosh here we go 
So, so no, that's that's good. You got to have fun with it too. That's another thing for kids. Just have fun. You, know, you have to have fun, and parents as well. I mean, gosh, sometimes we take it way too serious, especially at a young age. Yeah. Well, I am going to uh, forecheck you hard to come back on the show, and I think that we do a segment on. How do you how do you build an elite hockey player? Um, let's just see what you got to say. What you would do from the beginning all the way to you know to where they may have the opportunity to to, to play college hockey or major junior. I think that would be yeah. a lot of, a lot of fun. All right, I challenge you. Bring it. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. Congratulations on an, a legendary career. I mean, uh, national championship, uh, winning the Hobie Baker. Uh, playing for in the Olympics. I, we didn't even talk about that. No. Uh, an NHL career uh, where you just, you, you, you made it over a decade and that's not easy to do. So uh, my hat's off are to you. I'm bowing again, like I did no. earlier in the thing. Uh, thanks for being here. And I, uh, if there's anything I'm going to put, um, what, where, where can people find out about uh, what you and your wife, your family got going on? I'll put that in the description. We're at uh, Leopold's Mississippi Gardens, which is is the business. I am not on social media. I stay off it. Um, I just I I was on Instagram at one point, and I found myself um, letting my life slip slip away by watching what everybody else was doing. <laughs> nah, I like watching the cat and dog videos. You know. <laughs> yeah, when it when it really doesn't matter. I mean, I just take, it, take care of my own stuff. So, and and like I say, my wife w- doesn't like when I putz. So if I'm putzing on my phone, that's not a win. <laughs> yeah, that's not a win. So, anyways, thank you for sharing your journey. I know everyone is gonna uh, love hearing it. And uh, until next time, my friend, I hope uh, the world brings you nothing but the best. All right, sounds good. Thanks, buddy. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing Jordan Leopold's hockey journey and what a journey it was. One last thing before I let you go. If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon and do me a favor. Make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.